So thanks for the opportunity to, to join you here in Japan. Um, one of the yes, yes. Okay, so one of the interesting things that have come about in the last few years while we've been quite busy uh, making triples is that it becomes actually very difficult to start using this when you put it all together. So I, I think some of our effort now is to try to semantically integrate this knowledge that, that is being exposed in a way that actually makes quite a bit more sense than we can currently see. So the, the background, right, the framework for all of this is the semantic web effort. And really all of this is is a collection of standards for publishing our data, for sharing it, for querying it, and for making it available just like we do with our web pages and our own personal content. We can now start creating this uh, web of data. And more importantly is that it allows us to do some very interesting things that would be otherwise fairly difficult to do. And in particular, it can help us answer very sophisticated questions in ways that are not trivial because we're going to leverage information that is actually represented elsewhere, other background information. So I should mention, uh, along with Scott and um, uh, Andrea, um, uh, uh, we're interested in this from the perspective of the uh, W3C Healthcare and Life Sciences Interest Group. Uh, and, and we're trying to develop this more reasonable semantic web for, for uh, healthcare life sciences. One of the projects that I'm heading is this BioTRDF project many of you have probably heard about. And the important thing about BioTRDF is it's not actually meant to just um, take bi biological data and put it on the semantic web. What we really want to do is help create the framework or the infrastructure by which it becomes easier to do this. And by participating in the network, you are going to interlink with other resources. So it's basically a framework project. But by using this framework, we sort of have developed some methodology in which we take this raw data in whatever format it comes in, and we try to just basically make it, um, uh, we're trying to do a syntactic transformation into RDF. And so for each data set, we get these little RDF data sets. And where there are connections between them, when you put them together, you get the interconnected network. And then from this, you can start querying. The problem, of course, with this RDF based data is that you have to really understand what is in the data set to go from one to another. And so these topological maps like this tell you what connections currently exist between the data sets, but it's still really hard and you still have to figure out, well, for a particular data item, how do I go from here to there? And it's kind of still uh, very navigation oriented. So BioTRDF is one of the major contributors for life science data on the semantic web, and it makes some effort to try and interconnect the data sets. Um, where interconnections do exist, but then also feed back into the greater semantic web. So you can see right at the heart of the semantic web is DBpedia, which basically comes from the info boxes of Wikipedia articles. And we know Wikipedia covers a vast number of things. So if one wants to participate in the semantic web, one simply has to take their resources and link in at some point. So BioTDF uh, has uh, basically four, about 40 databases that we RDFIs and we interlink. And so in total, we have about 40 billion triples that we serve, that, that you can navigate, you can download, and, and you can start working with. But again, it's actually fairly uh, difficult to do this. You really have to understand what's in each and every one of those data sets in order to query across them. So a gene in one data set is not the same kind of gene as in another data set. And that was alluded to uh, in, in the last talk or in, in Andrea's talk. So the problem that we're now trying to face, um, Robert Hundorf and I have been thinking about these problems, is that we see these kinds of triples and there's a lot more to them than meets the eye. So a simple statement is fine if you know what you're looking for, but actually there's a bit more knowledge that's in this triple that hasn't been properly expressed. So if you look at this triple, it says nucleus is the subject, the, the relationship is part of, and the object is cell. And so what is the intent of this statement? Is it that there, for every uh, nucleus, um, it's always part of a cell? Or is it that every cell has a nucleus? Or is it mutual? Do you always see those two cases? Is it that a cell could be sometimes part of a, uh, or sometimes have a nucleus as a part? Or is it uh, always? Is it exactly one? There are a lot of unanswered questions as to what this statement actually means. 
And so in the next sort of generation, while we move, well, first step is really just let's just get the data into RDF, into a common syntax, have a, a query language that we can, we can query across. The next is really to figure out what exactly was meant by this statement. And if we were to ask a computer to answer questions, which ones of these questions would it, should it be able to answer? Which one is the right answer to, to the statement? So what we're interested in doing now is basically trying to take these triples and make an ontological commitment. That is, what exactly does it mean? And we should always be able to answer the question exactly the same. At the same time, and this was alluded to in Mark's talk, is that we need some level of semantic interoperability, right? Right now, we're quite busy just getting our data sets out there. But connecting them at the higher level requires us to coordinate exactly what we mean and how those are relating to one another. So this is the basis for semantic uh, interoperability. So how do we do this? Well, we just, Robert and I and others have just recently published a paper on formalizing the semantics for OBO relations, as we see in OBO ontologies. And what we want to do now is start applying this to the semantic web triples and start <coughs> to identify for when we see kinds of relationships, what are, the, what are the statements, what are the axioms that we'll generate from this? So if we see this statement, nucleus part of cell, and these two, the nucleus and cell, are classes. They're types of things for which there are many instances. Then what we have here is a relationship between these, um, uh, the instances of these two classes. Okay? So the intended meaning is that every instance of nucleus is part of, of an instance of a cell. Right? So this is when we see a nucleus, we expect it to be part of a cell. And so we can formalize this as an AL axiom. And now you really see the difference between triples and a more formal language. Um, so the axiom here is nucleus is a subclassive, so that means every instance of nucleus is an instance of something which is part of a cell. Okay? Um, and so this writes very differently than triples, when in fact it's not very natural to think of axioms in terms of triples, and that's what confuses people when they go from RDF to AL. It's really a different kind of language altogether. So what we have to do now is when we look at these triples or we see the kinds of information that we're generating from each of the data sets is try to apply the right axiom pattern in order to formalize the meaning of the statements that we're seeing. And so there could be a good number of inter interpretations for, uh, say, we have this um, class one relationship class two. We have our two classes in our relation. The intended meaning could very well be, and we see this sometimes in data sets, where the relationship is a type relation, right? So it basically is intending, the intention is that every C1 is a kind of C2. And we can formalize that. Now in AL, we have the proper vocabulary, and we say C1 is a subclass of C2. It could also be that you have, uh, for C1, that it's a subclass of something which holds a relationship to some other thing, right? And now you can see there's a good number of different kinds of expressions that we can formulate for just this one statement that we see, this one triple. So the challenge for us uh, is to understand the data well enough to make this ontological commitment. What exactly is meant by this? And what's the strongest thing we can say about the triple uh, as, as we see it there? So ontology in this case is really a strategy to formally represent knowledge. It's really different than how we have been using ontologies in the past, which has been largely for semantic annotation. Right? We have some data. We want to tag it with some terms from some vocabulary. That's how we've been doing it before. But what we're trying to do now is really change the way that we're expressing our knowledge such that it becomes much more uh, interesting. We can answer questions. We can check whether or not the statements we're making are true or whether they conflict with other statements. So I had kind of raised my hand and talked to, and, and, and Mark had also discussed it, it, was that we have been working on an ontology to formally represent knowledge. It basically tells us uh, the ontology helps us express the information in a consistent way, in a way that no matter whether you come from, say, a material sciences uh, data set or a, ge a geographic data set or whatever it is, there's going to be some way to express the information that you have, and then when we put it all together, it's going to work. So this is obviously a challenge and it's ongoing. And as we get new cases, we refine it and we, we continue uh, going on. But one of the, I think, 
strengths of the semantic science integrated ontology is this set of relations. And so we try to cover the things that people have in their data sets today and what we would like to see in our global knowledge um, uh, for tomorrow. So we have a set of ontology design patterns and these are being developed and refined uh, as we get more and more people uh, using it and presenting, ah, I want to represent, say, um, you know, um, uh, the results of a, a blast alignment, or I, I want to uh, represent the relationship between, say, a small molecule and uh, as a ligand uh, bound to some complex. This, so this is a semantic web ontology, right? So for every uh, I, for everything that we have in the ontology, you know, you can it has a URI, you can dereference it, and that basically means that tools like Sadie can start pulling out the information directly uh, from the ontology. Um, uh, online. So this is one of our principal drivers for the SIO is the SADI project where we've been creating a large number of semantic web services. Our goal is to make an interoperable set, uh, basically an ecosystem of services and this is our primary platform. The nice thing again for SADI is that you can go ahead and develop your own semantic web services with your own ontology, with your own relations, but if you want to join into the community at some point you need to make the formal representation of how do my types or my relations map to say this one. And I think that's the way that we get ground up uh, convergence over time. I don't have to tell you how to do it, but if you want to join in with the effort and you want to leverage what is already there, then you make the effort and you make the, 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 the integration happen. Okay, so there's a large number of people. These are big projects. Um, the BioTDF project is an open source project and the aim over the next year is basically to try to make it a little bit more accessible for people like you to create RDF data sets, uh, to participate in the network by making them available and to integrate with the other data sets that exist. Uh, again, SADI is also open source and if, uh, you'll probably get some exposure through this uh, biohackathon on how to create services, but we welcome your participation, uh, both in SADI and of course in, in SIO's development. Um, the formalization work, we just had a paper, we have a paper now out um, on formalizing uh, SBML biomodels. Uh, and this is where we actually find errors in curation in the biomodels database. And so uh, this is starting to show that the semantic web technologies are sufficient to do the kinds of things that we need to do in bioinformatics, check the consistency of data, answer questions, and discover new knowledge. Okay, thanks.